Uh, but we are glad you're here today. We are continuing uh, today and wrapping up actually a series we started through Luke chapter 18, um, looking at kingdom people. We're looking at some stories and some encounters Jesus had that really give us a picture or a description of kingdom people. What are kingdom people like? How do kingdom people pray? Um, how do keep kingdom people become kingdom people? Uh, and today we're going to look at a passage of scripture that I think is particularly interesting uh, because it, it tells us about kingdom people's faith. Now, before you think, well, kingdom people, of course, kingdom people have faith, um, we need to understand something about faith uh, similar to what we had to understand about prayer. Um, all kinds of people have faith, just like all kinds of people pray. Just because you pray or just because you have faith doesn't necessarily mean you're a kingdom person. Uh, we know that, for example, if you are here today and you have money in any financial institution, you are practicing some sort of faith, right? I mean, you, you have faith in that institution that when you go to get your money, the, faith is, the, the money is going to be there. You have a certain amount of faith that you practice when you get in your car and drive in the city of Jacksonville, right? That also may be good for your prayer life. I mean, those two things could be together. But, but you have a certain amount of faith that people around you are going to follow the traffic laws and they're going to be paying attention. And so you drive with a certain amount of faith. So faith itself is not unique to Christians. Uh, uh, people of all world religions and backgrounds have faith. Even people with, who, who would say that they're not religious or maybe they're atheists, even atheists practice faith in things. So the issue of having faith is not unique to kingdom people. But what we're going to look at today is the kind of faith that is unique to kingdom people. And the interesting thing about this encounter that Jesus had as he, we come to the end of Luke chapter 18 is that it's a picture of that reversal that we've seen all the way through Luke's gospel. Luke is constantly pointing out the way Jesus reverses what is expected and, and sort of what we believe how the world operates. And Jesus is constantly flipping that script on us. And you see it in this story really, really, really well. Um, if you're just joining us also, and we've been journeying through Luke this entire year, uh, you can go back to aspirejacks.org and, and listen to the old messages and sort of catch up on any of these uh, messages from Luke that we've been going or any of our other series as well. But as we look at this, as we look at this passage today and we, we look at this idea of someone who is practicing faith, this person is actually blind, meaning they cannot see at all. Now, a few things about blindness and sight that I found interesting as I was just preparing for this message over the last few weeks. Um, the eyes, doctors and biologists tell us that the human eye is among the most complex of all human organs. And, and just reading, I found out some interesting things about your eyes, that your eyes actually convert light into electrochemical impulses that are transmitted to your brain and that convert those images into what you see. So what you see is actually the reflection of light off of the object coming to your eye. Your eye transforms that into electrochemical impulses. That goes to your brain, and that, that's how you see it. It's super complex. Blindness uh, it was much more common in the first century than it is today. So I don't know how many people in the room know someone who is blind, either because they, maybe they had an accident or there, there was an illness or maybe they were born blind. But if you were to ask around uh, people today, you may have known a blind person or you may know someone, you may be someone yourself who's affected uh, with, with uh, an eye trouble, you have, you have difficulty seeing. Uh, but in the first century, everybody would have known someone who was blind. Everybody would have known probably multiple people. Most people would have been related to somebody who was blind, uh, mostly because obviously they didn't have the medical care we have today, but infections and accidents and all kinds of things would have led to blindness. And so it was very, very common. It was, it was not unusual to be walking down the street and not just to see one person who was blind begging, but multiple. There was no safety net like we have today. There was no way for people who had any disability to provide for themselves. So the only thing they could do would be, uh, would be to beg. Now, another interesting fact about blindness as it relates to the Bible. If you're someone who been in Sunday school, ever been in church much, and you've heard stories from the Old Testament, you've heard some amazing stories of miracles. I mean, dead people coming back to life, um, left people with leprosy being healed, all kinds of miracles uh, that, that are performed throughout the Old Testament. One miracle that you never see in the Old Testament is somebody who is blind having their sight restored to them. It doesn't happen anywhere. Moses never did that. 
Uh, Elijah never did that. Elisha never did that. None of the prophets, Ezekiel, Isaiah, none of them ever healed the blind. It, the blind. it just was not heard of in the ancient world. In fact, I just did a, a, a short study. I'm sure there's a much more exhaustive study to be done, but you don't even see it really talked about in extra biblical literature from the first century before Jesus. Blind people just stayed blind. There was no miracle. There was no healing. It all changed when Jesus came on the scene. In fact, as Jesus was walking around and encountering people, there is a story, there's at least one story in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, contain, each of them contain at least one story of Jesus restoring sight to the blind. And what's really interesting about this, if you were to count up all of the unique individual times that Jesus healed people in the Gospels, there are 25 examples of times that Jesus healed people of various infirmities. The majority of those, more than any other healing, Jesus restored sight to the blind. Now, that is pretty amazing if you think about it. Something that had never been done. There was no record of it in biblical history of, the, of sight being restored to the blind. And the interesting thing about that is the ability to source, restore sight to the blind was the thing that the prophets and everybody in the Old Testament had said would be the indicating factor that this was God's chosen person, that this was the Messiah. So when Jesus showed up and started healing the blind, that was a huge sign to the people who knew. Other people had been raised from the dead. Other people had had leprosy healed, but nobody had healed the blind. In fact, the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus was born, is speaking. He's prophesying from the word of God. And here's what he said in Isaiah 35, 5. And he, the Messiah, the promised one, the chosen one, he, when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. Isaiah 42, verse six and seven. I, the Lord, have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. I will take you by the hand and guard you. And I will give, to, I will give you to my people, Israel, as a symbol of my covenant with them. And you will be, listen to this, you will be a light to guide the nations. You will open the eyes of the blind. You will free the captives from, from prison, releasing those who sit in darkness. Now, there's also a New Testament story that I think plays a big part in this, in, this, in this reality, that the Messiah would be known because he would restore sight to the blind. If you know, that, if you know Jesus' cousin, he was six months older than Jesus, was a man named John. Call him John the Baptizer or John the Baptist. And John was sort of a modern-day prophet to the people of Israel. He was going around preaching to everybody, hey, you should get ready because the Messiah is coming. Repent, be baptized, turn from your sin, get ready because the Messiah is going to show up anytime. So he drew this huge crowd. People were coming out and seeing him. They were going out into the desert, and they were listening to John preach, and they were being baptized by John in anticipation of the coming of the Messiah. Well, John's cousin, Jesus, shows up on the scene. Nobody really knew who Jesus was at this point. He, he, he had done a miracle in Cana at a wedding, but it, it was kind of under the radar. Nobody really understood or knew much about him in the public. He, he, he really hadn't gone public with his ministry. He shows up to John, and John sees Jesus, and John's like, hey, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the guy. He's the Messiah. And Jesus says, hey, John, I want you to baptize me. And John says, no, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus says, no, let it be this way. And so John baptizes Jesus. And the Bible says that the spirit descended on Jesus and you heard the voice of God say, behold, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. This was the Messiah. Now, Jesus' ministry takes off. Like, he is all of a sudden, his ministry is really, really gaining in popularity. He's teaching, he's drawing bigger crowds. Meanwhile, John the Baptist crowds are diminishing. Like he's, he is actually, he's losing people. And, and things don't go well for John because ultimately he gets arrested by King Herod who has him sitting in, sitting in prison. Ultimately, he's gonna be beheaded. So as John is sitting in prison, like, you know, and if you were sitting in prison and you knew you were gonna be executed, you'd be asking yourself some pretty significant questions, right? I mean, like, is it, has it been worth it? Have I, have I wasted my life here? You know, did, did what I do actually matter? John, just like us, was asking those questions. So he called his disciples and said, hey, I need you to go and ask Jesus. I just need to be sure that what I've given my life to actually matters. Would you go and ask Jesus, hey, Jesus, are you the one or should we be looking for another? Are you the one or should we be looking for another? So, so Jesus, or John's disciples go to Jesus. Jesus. 
Now, that's a pretty simple question. And you would expect that Jesus would say, yep, I'm the guy, right? I mean, that's the, that's the easy answer. Because John is saying, hey, are you the Messiah? Should we be looking for somebody else? And so the disciples, John's disciples come and listen to how Jesus answered the question in Matthew 6, verse 3 and 4. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. Now, why was that answer so important? Because John knew that John's disciples knew, everybody knew that the only person who was gonna restore sight to the blind was the Messiah. Yes, John, I'm the one you've been looking for. You did not waste your life. You invested your life in doing the right thing, in doing the will of God. And so John was satisfied with that answer. Now, I want us to look in this story and remembering this about, about blindness and healing the blind. Look, turn in your Bible with me to Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 31. We're gonna see Jesus and his disciples as they're traveling to Jerusalem. They're on their way to Jerusalem. Uh, where Jesus ultimately is going to be arrested and tried. He's going to be crucified. The disciples do not know any of that is about to happen. And we're going to pick back up our study of Luke in January. So it's a big plug to come back way in January. I hope you'll come back before January. But, but we'll pick back up in Luke in January and finish up at Easter. But Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem where he is ultimately going to be crucified. And he's going to have an encounter with his disciples and with a man who was born blind. And as we look at this passage, I want us to look at three kinds of blindness. Two that you don't want and one that you do, okay? Two kinds of blindness that you do not want and one that you do. Now, as we're doing this, let me just describe for you what it would have been like in Jesus' day for a rabbi and his disciples. Because when rabbis would teach, uh, they would use travel time to do their teaching. Uh, obviously, they're not traveling by cars. They're not doing mass transit. So they're walking a lot. So as rabbis would walk with their uh, disciples, they would be teaching them about all the things that they have to say. And so the disciples would be kind of gathered around, jockeying for position, getting close to the rabbi in order to hear what he's saying. Jesus was just like that. If you've ever seen a movie of Jesus, you've probably seen a scene where Jesus is walking and the disciples are all around him. So as they would go through villages, the people in the town would often try to listen in what the traveling rabbi was saying. I mean, they didn't have podcasts, right? So the closest they could get was, hey, there's a rabbi traveling through. Let's see if we can follow along and kind of hear what he's saying and hear what he's, what he's teaching. So Jesus is walking through and uh, he's teaching his disciples. And the first kind of blindness that we're going to see is bl being blind to the will and the ways of God. Look at what happens, if being blind to the will and the ways of God. Look what happens in verse 31. And taking the 12, now we know there were probably more than the 12, but these are the 12 apostles, and there were probably other disciples and followers with him, so this could have been a crowd of, you know, anywhere from 12 up to 36 or 50 people following Jesus, trying to hear what he's saying. So, and taking the 12, he said to them, see, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished, for he will be delivered over to the Gentiles he will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. Jesus is being pretty clear here, right? I mean, this is, now a lot of times Jesus is talking in parables. He's, he's kind of talking in ways that the disciples don't understand. Jesus is not mincing words. Like, hey, the, what the prophet said is about to happen. Arrest, trial, flogging, humiliation, crucifixion, and resurrection. He is laying it all out here on the table for the disciples. But remember, <laughs> there, are, there are multiple kinds of blindness. And what you're getting ready to see is that the disciples were blind to the will and the ways of God. Listen, look at verse 34. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. Now, it seems pretty clear to us because we have the advantage of time, right? Right? I mean, we know how the story ends. Even if you're not a church person or you, you, know, you don't come to church very often, you probably know that Jesus was crucified. He was laid in the tomb for three days and after that time, he was raised from the dead. And it seems very obvious what, what Jesus is saying. But remember, we've got the advantage of looking back. The disciples did not have that advantage. They had no clue what was about to happen and they didn't understand. But this is saying it was hidden from them. What does that mean? What does it mean that it was hidden from them? 
I think there are two possibilities, and it's probably both, if, 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 I, if I think about it. The first was because what Jesus said didn't line up with their plans. It didn't line up with their expectations of who Jesus was. Have you ever had that experience in your life where, like, you heard something, but you already had such a strong preconceived idea about what was going to happen that you totally missed what the person was trying to say to you? I mean, if you're married, you've had that experience. I know you have, right? Right? I mean, but like it could have been a boss and you thought you understood what was supposed to happen. The boss told you something and and then you realize, wait, wait, I totally didn't get it. Now I see, on the backside, I see what he was trying to say, but I didn't understand it then. But here's the thing, you've had this same experience with God too. You've had this experience. You've had this time in your life where you thought you knew exactly what God's will was. You thought you absolutely know what God's plan was, what his purpose was, how he was gonna work it out. And you got into the situation, and on the other side of the situation, you, had no, you realized you had no clue. You had such a strong preconceived idea of who God was and how God worked and what you wanted. Your intentions were blinding you from seeing the will and the way of God. We've all been there because we're all human. So, so this idea that we're blinded by our own expectations. There are times when we think we know and we're so confident that we know that even though Jesus is saying something, it doesn't line up with our expectations so we don't hear it, we don't see it the way Jesus. The other possible reason that I think this was kept from, what this means about being kept from them is that this is an example of blessed ignorance. Blessed ignorance. Now, what I mean by that is what would the disciples have done if they had understood what Jesus was saying? I mean, if they really grasped it, what would they have done? Would they have left Jesus? Would they be like, oh, wait a minute. We thought you were gonna go be the king. We thought you were gonna kick out the Romans. If you're talking about like being crucified and like being arrested, I'm sorry, Jesus, I gotta get back to my fishing business, right? Because I didn't sign up to follow you for three years and leave everything behind just to see you killed at the end. I mean, this could have been an example of blessed ignorance. Here's the thing. We've all been there. We've all had the blessing of ignorance before. Because what would you have done if you had known? I mean, I don't mean just about Jesus and his day. I mean, I'm talking about the trials that you've been through. And you look back on them. What would you have done if you had known the diagnosis? What would you have done if you had known about the job change. I mean, there are times in life where your ignorance was actually a blessing and God preserving you for something, and you look back now and you're like, I am so glad I did not see that coming. Because I would have made different decisions and ultimately, those decisions might have created a bigger problem in the long run. I love what the theologian Tom Wright says about this idea of blessed ignorance and how this is an example of this for the disciples. Here's what he says. In his death... Jesus will take on himself the blindness and despair of the world. There is so much still that we do not understand, so much in the world and indeed in the scripture that remains hidden from us. As Jesus' words were to the disciples, there is much that if we understood it fully might make us turn back and no longer wish to follow Jesus on the road. But if we go with him, Jesus will take the full weight of that evil onto himself. Indeed, he has already done so on the cross so that the things we still face need hold no terror over us. Let me me say something here that is a broad generality, but I absolutely have complete confidence is true. And that is you have no idea, no idea what's in front of you. You don't know. You do not know the challenge that may happen when you get out of church today or tomorrow, or this week, or next month, or next year, right? You don't know what's happening. You have blessed ignorance, but here's what I do know. Those things that you can't see, we follow a God who already knows about them. In fact, he is the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, meaning he is already there in the future for the things you don't see. You don't have to see them. You don't have to understand them. You just have to put the faith, your faith in the God who does. See, hindsight is always 2020. It can be hard to see what God is doing in the middle of our circumstances. But here's where the promise of Romans 8, 28 comes in, that we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and who've been called according to his purpose. See, we fear the unknown. But what if God is preparing you for the unknown right now? Not by giving you all the information you lack, but by building your faith as he reveals himself to you. 
that the confidence that says all things will work together for the good. Not that all things are good, but I can have confidence right now in the things I don't see and the things I don't understand, not because I see and understand what's gonna happen, but because I see and understand God, his purposes and his ways. See, the disciples were blind to that. They thought they understood their circumstances, but they didn't understand their circumstances and they didn't understand God's plan. They were blind to their circumstances and blind to their plan. Now, don't miss what happens next because this is so ironic. Uh, this is why I love the Gospels and the way they're written. So ironic what happens next because look, 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 what, look at this next encounter. The disciples clearly heard Jesus say they clearly do not see and do not understand. And then look what Luke says. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And he heard a crowd, he heard the crowd going by. He inquired what this meant and they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Now again, remember, every, Jesus is coming. The people see Jesus coming. The crowd starts gathering. They're trying to catch and listen to what Jesus is saying. This blind man cannot see who it is, but he probably understands that rabbi is coming. So when he's asking, the crowd tells him, hey, it's, oh yeah, Jesus of Nazareth. He's coming by. He, Jesus is walking by. Now, Mark's gospel tells us that this man's name is Bartimaeus. So we're gonna refer to him as Bart the rest of the day. Luke doesn't tell us his name, but this is, this is blind Bart, okay? So, so, and he introduces us, we see through this story another form of blindness, all right? Because, and you see it in the disciples. Not only were the disciples blind to the will and the ways of God, but also they were blind to the needs of others. Look at verse 38. And he, Bart, cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now listen to what it says in verse 39. Don't miss this. And those who were in front. Now remember, what did I tell you? Jesus is walking and teaching. His disciples are following him. Who was in front? The disciples. Probably Peter, James, and John. I mean, those were the three who were always on the inside. You probably had Peter, James, and John in the front. You had Andrew, you had Judas, you had all of them around. Those who were in front rebuked him. Who rebuked Bart? The apostles did. Peter probably did. Like, they're walking down the street. They're trying to listen to what Jesus is saying. This guy, this blind man sitting over here begging is saying, hey, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. Peter's like, hey, shh, dude, be quiet. We're trying to hear what he's saying. Like, we're, we're trying to pay attention. Jesus, have mercy on me. Hey, be quiet. Be quiet. We want to hear what he has to say. <laughs> and, but those who were in front rebuked him, telling him, be silent. But look at his response. He cried out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Who were those people in front? It was the apostles. They were not only blind to the will and the ways of God, they were blind to the needs of the people around them. They were rebuking this guy because he was creating a distraction. I mean, it would be like today, us driving down the road, listening to a podcast of whoever your favorite preacher is, right? And, and suddenly somebody's like, hey, hey, there, I, I need to know about that. I need to know what to say. Hey, be quiet. I'm trying to listen. I'm trying to, I'm trying to pay attention here. I mean, this guy was desperate, and the disciples in the front were telling him to be quiet. And this wasn't the only time that Jesus' followers were blind to the needs of others. We just saw it last week. Luke chapter 18, verse 16 and 17. The disciples didn't want people bringing their babies to Jesus. They were trying to pay attention to Jesus, and all these mothers were coming with these infants and babies. And, they're like, and the disciples were like, hey, send them away. They're crying. They're loud. Like, we can't even hear Jesus. Take those babies to the back of the room. Here, they were doing it again. Mark chapter two, there was a, Jesus is teaching in a house. The crowd had gathered around the house so thick that four guys who were taking their friend who was disabled, they were carrying him on a pallet because they knew if they could just get him to Jesus, Jesus would heal him. Who, but the people who were in front, including the disciples of Jesus, were blocking the way. So what these guys do? They climbed up on the roof and they dug a hole and they lowered their friend to Jesus. There's another story that we looked at uh, several months ago from Luke chapter eight, a woman who had been sick for 12 years. Jesus is walking through town. Who's around him? All his disciples. They're in the front, the people in the front. This woman's desperate to get to Jesus. 
because she knows if she could just grab the end of his garment that she'll be healed. So she presses her way through the crowd, trying to push through those who were in the front to grab hold of just the end of his garment so that she can be healed. The disciples, time and again, those who were in front were blind to the needs of the people around him. The disciples' blindness prevented them from understanding what Jesus was telling them about the cross, and it kept them from understanding Jesus' mission to seek and save the lost. And this is a really important reminder for those who are in the front. I'm talking about those of us in the room who are in the front. We need to listen to this and pay attention. We need to remember that Jesus came for the people in the back of the line. And for those of us who are in the front, if we're not willing to part ways and let those who are in the back get access to Jesus, we are blind to Jesus and all his mission and all his ways, and we're blind to the needs of others. It happens in church all the time, and I've said this repeatedly, and I always get some pushback on it, but I'm just so convinced it's true that church does not exist for the benefit of its members. The church exists for the benefit of its non-members. Church is not about you, and it's not about me. It is about the people who are at the back of the line. Those of us who are in the front have to be sensitive to the ways and the will of Jesus And we also have to be sensitive to the needs of other people. We have to be ready to step aside to let them get closer. So Bart is over here crying out. The disciples are telling him no. But did that stop him from crying? No. What does scripture say? It says, he cried out all the more. Now it's interesting because it says in your English Bible that he cried out. It says it twice. It it says that he cried out to Jesus in uh, verse verse 36. He cried out to Jesus, and then you see it again in verse 38 and 39. He cried out to Jesus. But the second time it says he cried out all the more. Now what's missing in English that we don't catch is the Greek, it's actually he cried out like an animal. He cried out like a beast that was in distress. Have you ever heard a person just scream out in utter anguish? I remember one time we uh, had a a funeral here. We've had several funerals for different cultures over the time. And some cultures wail. Have you you ever heard anybody wail? I mean, that's what this this, uh, guy was doing. Like it was a guttural, desperate sound when he cried out all the more, Jesus, have mercy on me. And, And I see this and I remember the story of the persistent widow from a few weeks ago at the beginning of Luke 18, that she just wouldn't stop asking Here you see this guy's persistent, but you also see this guy is humble because what's he saying? Jesus, have mercy on me. He didn't feel entitled to Jesus' healing. He understood that it was only by Jesus' mercy that he would be healed. So he was persistent and he was humble in what he's crying out for. Some of you, some of you in the room today have been rejected by the people in the front of the line. I talked to those of us who are in the front of the line, but let me just talk for a minute for those in the room who find themselves in the back of the line, who aren't the closest to Jesus. You've been on the outside looking in, and you bear religious scars from the condemnation and judgment of people who have been, who have tried to keep you from getting to Jesus. Here's what you need to know based on this passage of scripture and many others, by the way. This is not the only one. Jesus hears you. He hears you. The people who are in the front may be blocking your way to Jesus, but let me assure you, Jesus hears you. And you know what you can do? You should cry out all the more because Jesus always responds to the cries of the hurting. God always responds to the cries of the hurting. So here in this passage, we get to the third type of blindness. You've got being blind to the will and the ways of God. You've got blind to the needs of others. And then the third kind of blindness is, and this is the kind of blindness that we all want. This is the kind of blindness that defines kingdom people, and that is blind faith, blind faith. Look what happens next in verse 40. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And I imagine for us, we're thinking, well, that's a pretty obvious question, right? I mean, he clearly wants you to heal him of his sight. He wants, you to, he wants you to restore his sight clearly. That's what we would say. I don't think that was so obvious back then because remember, blind people didn't get healed. There was no biblical evidence that blind people ever had their sight restored. So, so 
what do you want from me? Jesus is asking this guy, what do you want from me? He could have said anything. Here's what I, I think. I think there are times in our walk with Jesus where we don't know how to answer that question. When Jesus comes and says, what do you want from me? In fact, if, you could, if Jesus were in front of you right now and he said to you, what do you want from me? What would you say? What, what would you respond? If you're like me, you might hedge your bets. Because like, I, I would. I mean, I honestly would. I'm just being honest. I mean, here's the thing. If Jesus said, what do you want? I'd be thinking to myself, okay, now, I know what I really need the most. I know what, but that's like, too, that's too hard. That's not going to happen. So let me just manage my expectations and dumb it down a little bit here and make it something that Jesus could probably do. That's what I would do. Now, come on, right? I'm just being honest. If Jesus came and said, what do you want? What is the thing in your life right now that seems the most desperate, the most needed, but you have absolutely zero hope or zero confidence that God would do it? Because that's what Jesus was asking this guy. He could have just healed him, but he didn't. He made this guy wrestle with this question because wrestling with this question was actually testing this guy's faith. What do you want? Right now, what are you afraid to ask Jesus to do? What are you afraid to ask him? Because you think he would never do it, so I better manage my expectations. But here's the truth, right? He might not do it. I mean, he might not. But here's what I need in my life. I need to at least confess to him what I perceive as my deepest need, what my biggest request is, because until I confess that to him, I will always harbor it somewhere separate as if Jesus isn't powerful enough. If Jesus says no, that's okay. But if I keep it that a secret tucked away inside of me, I never have the opportunity to allow my faith to grow in Jesus or to allow Jesus to transform me and change my wants and change my perspective on what I think I most need. This man could have asked Jesus for anything. Fear could have caused him to manage his expectations. I mean, after all, nobody blind had ever been healed before. He could have simply asked Jesus for food or for money, but he didn't. He asked Jesus for what he needed most. Look at verse 41. He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. Pretty plain, pretty simple, pretty direct. And my guess is, whatever you most need from Jesus can be stated as simply as that. Heal my marriage. It feels impossible. There is no way this can be saved. Heal my marriage. Bring my child home. Provide in this impossible situation. Heal my loved one. Heal me. There are situations in your life right now that Jesus is saying, what do you want? What do you want? This man knew what he wanted. He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. Look at verse 42. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. What faith? Faith to believe that Jesus could do what no one had ever done. Faith to believe that Jesus could do what no one else had ever done or could ever do, and that is restore sight to the blind. This man demonstrated such amazing faith in this encounter that Jesus pointed out, it is your faith that has made you well. And look what it says in verse 32. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him. And catch this, glorifying God. Don't miss what it says right here. And all the people when they, what? <laughs> all the people when they saw it gave praise to God. I mean, the irony here, right? All through this entire passage of scripture, it's just everybody's blind. Everybody who can see with their eyes are blind. They don't see who Jesus is. They don't see what his ways is. They don't understand his purposes. They don't see the needs of the people who are all around him. They're blind all the way around. The only person in this story who actually sees and understands who Jesus is and what Jesus can do is the only person in the story who can't see with his eyes. Why? Because he's practicing a blind faith because that's what kingdom people do. They practice blind faith. And notice what happens. His ability to see what no one else could see actually restored sight to the other people in the story. Suddenly, the disciples understood something about Jesus that they didn't understand before. Something, some, suddenly, all the people around Jesus understood his mission. 
Because Jesus is reaching out to the people at the back of the line because that's who he came for. Blind Bart's faith was greater than the faith of those who could see. He understood Jesus' mission to restore sight to the blind and to set the captives free. Jesus was headed to the cross where he was gonna end darkness and sin. But the disciples couldn't see that. They couldn't understand that. Meanwhile, the blind man was healed by his blind faith in Jesus. I I love the definition that the Bible gives us of faith. From Hebrews 11, verse one, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Blind faith. It's the only kind of faith It's the only kind of faith that is strong enough to heal you. It's the only kind of faith that allows you to see Jesus in all his power, understand his mission, understand his purpose, and understand his ways. Faith is the conviction of things not seen. Bart had that kind of faith. And here's what I think for us as kingdom people, and I know not everybody in here is or aspires to be a kingdom person, but for those of us who are, I think this is such a simple truth and so important for us Because you're gonna leave out of here and you don't see what's coming. You do not see what's coming. You are blind to that. I think kingdom people embrace the Savior they cannot see in situations they do not understand to practice blind faith in God, his purposes, and his ways. Kingdom people embrace the Savior they cannot see. If you are listening to me today, you have never seen Jesus, but neither had Bart. And it reminds me of a story uh, towards, towards the end of the Gospel of John. You know, uh, Thomas missed the meeting where Jesus showed up, the resurrected Jesus showed up, and he didn't believe. He's like, I don't believe it. I don't believe he's back alive. I, you know, if, if, and the only way I'm going to believe it is if I can put my fingers in, his, in the scars where his, the nails were. It's the only way I'm going to believe it. So next, the, the very next Sunday, Jesus shows up again. He's like, hey, Tom, put your finger right here, buddy. It's me. And Thomas falls on the ground. It's like, my Lord and my God. And and Jesus' response, don't miss this because he's talking about you, okay? Don't miss this. Jesus' response to Thomas was, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's you. You have the opportunity to exercise a faith that the disciples could never exercise, a blind faith in Jesus. Kingdom people embrace the Savior they cannot see in situations they do not understand. And can we all just be honest? We don't understand many of the difficult circumstances we're going through or that we've been through. And here's the truth of the matter. You may never understand. You may live your life, your entire life, and never understand why that happened. You may never understand why you lost your parents. You may never understand why you lost a child. You may never understand why your marriage didn't work out. You may never understand the diagnosis. You may never understand the verdict. You may never understand. But here's what I want to encourage you. When you can't see the situation and you don't understand the situation, look to Jesus because he does. He understands. He knows. And he is the one who through his crucifixion, through his death and resurrection, is restoring sight to the blind. He is giving you a faith that goes beyond what you can see. Kingdom people embrace the Savior they cannot see in situations they do not understand to practice a blind faith in God, his purposes, and his ways. Let me ask you, are you blinded by your preconceived ideas of how life should be? Are you blinded by a sense of entitlement that you think that somehow things ought to go a certain way and and you are missing what God may be doing in your life through a difficult circumstance? You're maybe even mad at God because you didn't see this coming? Do you have enough faith, blind faith in Jesus to trust him when you don't understand the situation? Have you already determined how God should react, what God should do? Or are you willing to trust him in ways that you can't see. One of my favorite verses, and I would encourage you, if you only are gonna memorize uh, you know, one or two verses, these verses are definitely, should be at the top of your list. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Don't, igno- don't lean on your own understanding. 
Have blind faith in Jesus. And, and just as a word of encouragement, for those of you who are, you're going through a difficult time right now, I mean, you are desperate. You do not understand. You do not see. You can't possibly conceive of how God can be using this situation for good. Let me encourage you to love him and live your life according to his purpose and trust, trust the unseen hand of God. And when you can't see God's hand, trust God's heart. When you can't see the hand of God and you don't understand what he's doing, trust his heart because he loves you. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. Trust him.